This is the main letter of the alphabet. This is the focal point of everything. So this is the Kadosh Kadoshim, which is the most set apart of the set apart, the most sacred of the sacred. It's translated the Holy of Holies. So it's a sprout of rejoicing. I'll explain this in a moment. It's the letter Zadi. So let's start off by proclaiming in English, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And we'll say it as Hodu la Yahweh ki tov ki le olam chazdo. And the word chazdo is chesed, het samik dalet, chesed with a vav at the end, make it, instead of saying chesed do, it's, they change the emphasis of the syllables, so it's Chazdo, but it's, you can read it as Chesed, though, or His Chesed. So this is, this is something that we've talked about in previous weeks, and Lee and Sarah, remember, they printed them up in red letters in the paleo, so we could put it on a window or on an automobile windshield or something. But part of this class, remember, is to learn Hebrew, to learn to speak it, to learn to read it. So why don't we all get up and say it? so that these words will be on your lips. Ho du la yawa ki tov ki le olam chaz do. Okay, now let's sing it, re, or say it rejoicing. We actually played it last week at the end. We could sing it if anybody wants to, but let's just say it as a shout to Yahweh. Ho du la yawa ki tov ki le I mean, maybe we could play the song at the intermission break or something if we can cue it up, if uh, the uh, techies can maybe manage that. Hi. So the letter Zadi. Does anybody remember a verse about the Mashiach coming back and ruling with an iron scepter? Here's an iron scepter. It's actually kind of almost like a harpoon. It is actually the letter Zadi, which is a fish hook. I don't know if you can see it in this light. I'll draw it on the board. The paleo letter Zadi is a line with a, a fish hook on it. That's, that's this letter here. And as a, as a fish hook, the other, I, I just had this made by a blacksmith up to, just got it this morning, up in uh, Bridgetown Forge, if anybody's interested. And I had him put a nine inch nail, a nine inch spike on the tip of this. The other interesting thing about how this works, though it's not just a fish hook, but it's similar to a pike, which was an ancient weapon. If a guy has a shield, and if you go to poke the guy, you know, the shield's in the way, but you can pull back with this hook and then get him that way. So my point is, this weapon, though it's like, okay, well, this is a medieval weapon, it's a harpoon, it's a fish hook, but this weapon, which is the word zadi, and the word zadik means righteous, zadika is doing righteous works, philanthropic good deeds to one another, it is the weapon that Yahweh has given us by which our enemy's defenses are pulled away, and not that we're going to go out there and spear anybody, but I designed this thing to be similar to a Roman spear. The Roman spears had a long shaft of metal with a point up at the end and then a, a wooden handle down here. Does anybody know what significance to the Romans were nine inch nails? There's a band. That's what they use for crucifixion. There's a band called Nine Inch Nails, and you might think, boy, that would be pretty hard to type with a, you know, they weren't talking fingernails. This Nine Inch Nail was about the size of what they staked Yeshua to the cross with. So to put that at the tip of this Zadi, you see, that's the shape of the letter Zadi. But to intentionally make this is to say, this is a scepter of iron. And the scriptures say that when he comes back, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. But yet he rules in righteousness. So to make a 
a scepter of iron as this letter that's its name is righteousness and to have at the tip the nine inch nail that he was pinned to the cross with because we disregarded his righteousness I'm just trying to play into types the idea of the black and white also is that white linen like the white fence on the Mishkan is the robes of righteousness which is simply doing what he said black is typically ink you know so you have the black letters written on the parchment skins and so I understand that the scribes have this concept Avi ben Mordecai wrote about it saying there's this notion of black fire is the letters and white fire is the spaces in between the letters and you go what does that mean you have you read the spaces in between the letters when he, when I first read his book he actually wrote three books, Messiah 1, Messiah 2, and Messiah 3. And the, the Messiah 3 book was yanked from circulation, and maybe all of them are by now, I'm not sure. But it was like, why pull this from circulation? There's some very interesting information in here. It was a bit disturbing to some. But, but the point is about his book, when he talks about white fire, the spaces between the letters, I thought... That's kind of confusing, and now I'm very disturbed that I don't know what this means, and I can't read them. It's like trying to say, well, you got to read in between the lines. And it's like, well, how do you read in between the lines? If it's in English, and somebody says, well, just kind of, you know, try to guess what they're inferring. Okay. But we're not talking about guessing what somebody's inferring. We're talking about reading Scripture. And if Yahweh himself is going to speak... And he's going to give us these black letters written in ink. And he said, pay attention to these letters. And then some other teachers come up and say, oh, yes, but there's also the white spaces between the letters that you have to learn how to read. I don't know what that means. And again, when I first heard that, when I read it in his book, it's disturbing. I mean, I'm trying to sit here and learn what the words are, and now somebody's telling me that there's invisible words I have to read. And it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, on the chart here, and I don't know the answer to the question in terms of what the, the sages and the scribes really say, but this is my perspective for what it's worth. On the chart here, right through the middle, there's this dotted line. And it says meta, change in place or condition. Now, if you have a, a good dictionary, we happen to have a really thick old dictionary from the 1930s or 40s, and it's got words in it that aren't in modern dictionaries. The word meta literally means a change in place or condition. And I, I mentioned this once before, I think, but I'll go over it again here. As I was looking through this dictionary, I saw there's, I, I picked out 22 of the different words that started with the word meta. Meta element, meta mere, meta nucleus, meta basis, metaphor, so forth. And when I saw the definitions, I realized, boy, these words almost perfectly describe the transition between one of the Hebrew alphabet letters. What is changing when you go from Aleph in Tibet. What is, what is actually happening when you transition from Gimel to Dalit? And if you stop and think about that and go, okay, let me make it a little easier. What happens between Mem and Noon? Now remember, Mem is like the womb or the environment, like the water. And if Noon is the fish, well, the fish is in the water, but the fish isn't the water. The, the water is the environment, and the noon is the living thing in the environment, and the fish jumps out of the mem. So, just, just to go back over this a little bit, the mem in the paleo... Yeah, we're going to do Zadi. We'll get there. The mem is um, like this wave of water, and the noon... Is like this springing of jumping out of the mem. So if you get the idea, what's the transition happening between mem and noon? If you're thinking of mem, you're thinking of environment. If you're thinking noon, you're thinking the object that is in the environment that leaves the environment. 
So now what's the white space between the black letters, you might say, of Mem and the black letter Noon? You have to change your thinking to go from environment to living object. So, and, and I, don't, I haven't looked at this for a long time. Let me see, what did I put between Mem and Noon? Um, Mem says metalicious to dwell, care for, cherish, or worship. And it also has to do with working metals. You say, well, what does that have to do with it? That word, metalicolus, excuse me, metalicolus, means to dwell, care for, to cherish, or worship. Well, that's what Mem is all about. Remember, Mem is a womb, and it has to do with cherishing the one in. And then you look at noon, and it has having real being, the essential truth of reality, which is to say the supernatural perspective, which is to say, you know, what's, what's, what's going on, the difference there? One has to do with nourishing like this environment, and the next one disregards the vi- environment, which is kind of a subjective focus on the self, and it gets into the, the supernatural, the real, the transcending of what's all this about anyway. And so you have to change from a certain focus to another focus. And, and, and not to belabor this, but if you go back and read all of these and try to line them up with the letters, and then how does one letter go into the next? Like Aleph is variegated as a spectrum. What does that got to do with Aleph? Meta element. That's what it means, is variegated as a spectrum. And it's like, if Aleph is the plan, what's the Aleph bet? The Aleph bet itself is the variegations of white light, as it were, turning into the different colors. The variegations of the Aleph plan turning into the different concepts of each one of the 22 letters. Okay, so what's a Zadi, and what does Zadi have to do with this? Well, the picture of the Zadi in the Paleo, being a fishhook, and, and remember, I'm trying to show you different props and different things based on what the letter looks like so that it'll lock into your brain. So if you, if you picture this fish hook, somebody can tell you, oh, Zadi is a hunter or a fisher, and you go, okay, now I have to memorize that. But hopefully the picture of this will go, wow, that's that, that, that harpoon thing. Here's another picture. Here's a log. And if the log catches fire, with a flame coming out of it, there's a zoddiness to it because it's, it's something which is now sprouting something else. If you have a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly, so he sprouts a wing, there's a zoddiness to that. If you have a rose bush and it sprouts, the bud sprouts into this flower, there's a zoddiness there. If you have a mouth, a pay, and the mouth speaks something that it sprouts open, that word is pay zadi. The what we did last week was the was the letters pay zadi. One thing I was trying to do last week is also is to embody what it was about. So apologize for being a little bit loud and emphatic, but Pei Zadi Zadi, I think I mentioned it, Pei Zadi Zadi is the word to explode or detonate or to break everything into little pieces. And the word pizza, though in the dictionary says, well, that comes from a foreign word, it literally is to break everything into little pieces and scatter them around like an explosion. So the word pizza literally is pure Hebrew. Pa-za. or depending on what vowel points you put under the pay, whether it sounds like a yo, like an e, or an e, or an a. Ah. In paleo, again, there is no vowel points to deal with. And I've read in some books, whether it was Isaac Moses son or who, I'm not sure, but I've heard that nobody really knows how the words in the ancient language were ever spoken. So the fact that I'm butchering the language by not using proper vowels. I could apologize, but all I'm saying is that I'm not conforming to the standard acceptable way of speaking that we have today. But nobody knows. So the Masoretic scribes back in the Middle Ages 
came up with certain ways to, to maintain proper pronunciation, and they do them with the vowels. So those of you who don't know Hebrew, we haven't addressed this, but if you have a zadi, you might have a line this way, or you might have a line that way, it might have a dot or two dots, it might have a couple dots this way, or you might have a dot here, or you might have a dot here, and those are all different vowels. Those dots and lines are the vowels. They don't add letters like in English, you add A-E-I-O-U. They don't do that in Hebrew, they add these dots or lines. Well, the point of this is that there's some relationships between the letters, and we'll probably get into this more with next week, Kuf is, is, a, is an overview, a helicopter view of the whole Mishkan, as it were, but the Zadi is a sprout. So if you look in the Red Dictionary, it says Zad literally means something coming out the side. And so there's a picture of a hunter who's laying down in the bushes and he's got his knee up in the air. And it kind of looks like here's the body and the hunter's got his knee up in the air. Well, that almost looks like a grasshopper, right? Kind of, sort of. The point is, the letters that, or the only insects which are kosher to eat, happen to be the insects with their knee going up in the air. The grasshopper, the cricket, the locust, those are kosher insects. And it's just like this similar, it's like, is it a coincidence that the zadi, which is the righteous letter, the, the letter that means righteousness, has this sprout coming off its side, and the only kosher insect to eat has its leg coming out its side. So the sages, those people who study the Hebrew, notice these things that are correlations and say, this is no coincidence. It must be a picture on purpose. So before I mention this, how many of you would have ever looked at a grasshopper and said, hey, there's the letter Zadi? You couldn't do that. So I'm bringing these points out to say, something coming out the side. So I knew of a certain congregation where the, the leader was teaching people how to render Hebrew from the perspective of what the letters mean. And when he sees the letter Zadi in a word, he equates it to a hunter with his knee up in the air. It's like, why would a hunter have his knee up in the air? Well, because if you read in the Red Dictionary, it means to hunt or to fish. And a hunter maybe has his knee up in the air as he's crouching down, or maybe his elbow's up in the air or something, but he just says, okay, well, Zadi means um, a hunter or a fisher or the guy with his knee in the air. So then he would take, this was a few years ago, he would take this notion of a hunter with his knee into his air, in the air, and he'd weave it into the meanings of the other letters to extrapolate what that word was really saying. Is that fair to do? Sure, I do the same thing. That's what this chart's all about. What I'm saying though, is if you, the purpose of this chart is to say, well, here's the letter Zadi, and you can read all this stuff down here, and those are all Zadi issues, and you can take any word with a Zadi in it, pick out any one of those matters and say, those are Zadi concepts that might be applicable in this word. Sure, so is a hunter with his knee in the air. But how does that help you understand the word? Well, whatever this other guy was doing, using the fact that Zadi was a hunter with his knee in the air, has a certain degree of validity. And it might help you to a certain degree with understanding how to read scripture. My point is, a hunter with his knee in the air, a grasshopper, a piece of wood with a flame on it, a bug with a wing, those are pictures of what a Zadi means, but they're not Zadi. They're a picture which embodies Zadi-like images. Just like Tet is a snake, they say. So some people look at the letter Tet, and every time they see the letter Tet, they see a snake. Remember the letter Tet it was like a shield. In Paleo it's this, and in Modern, it's that. Well, how do you see a snake? Well, one way to see a snake here is that a snake coils up its body and here's these viper fangs. There's the head that will bite you with. But I came out that day with a sword and a shield because the, the snake's head with his fangs is kind of like the sword and the coiled body of the snake is like the shield. 
shield is round, the snake rounds up, that's the way it shields itself. But the letter Tet isn't a snake. A snake represents the imagery of the letter Tet. The letter Tet also means a full basket. Well, you think of a basket as round, but a full basket is you pile something up. What I'm saying is that the way to read these letters is more than just assigning individual concepts to them. So what does this have to do with Zadi? We were talking about a couple weeks ago that the ayin was eyes, it's also judgment, it's also scales. Being eye, it's also ocular. It also means to look well to, to regard, to consider. It's also being ocular, it's the occult realm, the realm of visions. And the people that can see those visions and put weight to those visions kind of trumps or supersedes the letter that came before it, which was the Samic, which lines up with the menorah, which lines up with the day of creation number four, which is putting the sun, moon, and stars in the sky, which has to do with time. And so I rendered the equation, the, the parallel to you, that the Samic was like the dimension of time, the iron was like the dimension of the spiritual realm or the occult or demons and angels, but then this pay, which comes after the ion, is the words, the words of Mashiach. And that because Israel regarded sorcery, divination, perversion, and the visions of their heart, and didn't regard his words, their eyes were blinded to the truth. And that the pay is not just a mouth, but the pay is a mouth which opens. And that there's this way of looking at it, the saying metaphorically, the pay being the open mouth, which is understanding the words, addresses the closed eyes of the ion for those who trust in their visions and the occult and disregard the words. But for the pay to open up its mouth and speak, there has to be understanding of the words. But not just understanding of the words, something has to come of the words. The zadi is the sprouting of something which is otherwise dormant, which is like the words coming to life. Why is zadi after pay? Why is zadi the letter that it equates to the Ark of the Covenant inside the Kadosh Kodashim, which is inside the covered place, which is inside the Mishkan, which is completely set apart from everything else. Why is this letter so special? So the reason for the, the colors here in the jacket, having the ribbons and all, is because the letter is so special. So I have here the ribbons of the colors blue, purple, red, and white, the colors of the Mishkan pattern. and. The Ark of the Covenant had the golden lid, called in English the mercy seat, the, the, the covering of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as Jamie was saying, the high priest would come in once a year, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation. They would be forgiven. This is an incredible object, an incredible event for the nation's year. And there are stories, the last chapter of the book of Exodus, chapter 40, and also in Numbers, uh, I think it's in 14. I've got them written down, we'll get to it later. It talks about the building of the ark, the regulations for the priests. They were supposed to wrap it up in a turquoise wool. So we got the turquoise color and the blue because the zadi is the blue color here. So again, I'm trying to reference colors so that you can equate it to the chart. If later on you're looking at this tape and you're looking at the chart, it'll just kind of help stick. So you've got the gold covering, you've got the blue, the turquoise wrappings, the wool covering the Ark of the Covenant when they were transported, and you've got the, the festive look, you might say, being that it's the, it's the great occasion. Now, the interesting thing about all these models and all these different systems that we've talked about, the Mishkan pattern, the alphabet pattern, the days of creation pattern, we've got the festival, the Moedim pattern, and they're, they're all working like wheels within wheels. The wheel is a circular pattern. Every one of these things is a circular pattern. 
and they're all fitting together, kind of spinning at different rates. Now, I don't know what Ezekiel saw in the first chapter when he talks about seeing these wheels and these wheels within wheels, and, and nobody knows, and everybody speculated what he saw. And so you have uh, Andrew Gabriel Roth wrote a book called Wheel of Stars, which is pretty interesting about reckoning with the calendar and the constellations, and just came out this year. It's a good book. But what I'm saying is that, so if I'm saying, well, the Zadi is the Ark of the Covenant, and that lines up with the day of Yom Kippur, and Jamie was saying how it's like, well, there's this element of the Passover sacrifice, but I'm saying, well, the Chet, which is the big white fence, lines up with uh, Passover, and the table of showbread lines up with Yom Kippur, what does that got to do with the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant being in the seventh position of the pieces of the Mishkan, you've got the big white fence, that's one, you've got the, right inside the big white fence, you've got the barbecue grill, the altar sacrifice, that's two, then you've got the labor, that's three, you got the menorah, that's four, table of showbread, five, altar of incense, six, then there was the veil, and then you've got the Ark of the Covenant, seven. So this is the seventh piece in that sequence of what was in the Mishkan. Well, lining up with the seventh day, it lines up with Shabbat. So now I'm, I'm drawing the correlation between the Ark of the Covenant and Shabbat, the seventh day of creation. Then if you look at the festivals, you got Pesach, Hagmatzot, Shavuot, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and then Shemini Atzeret. That's the seventh one, lines up with the Zadi. Most people ignore the Shabbat. Most people ignore Shemini Atzeret. If you render, we've gone through this before, but I'm just reiterating here. If you render Shavuot, the day of counting to 50, as two festivals, then Shemini Atzeret is not a festival because Sukkot is the seventh festival. But just like Mem and Nun, are the pregnancy period and the giving of birth, Shavuot, I see in this pattern as being, you wave the sheep, then there's the 50 days of counting, and then there's waving the loaves. That's like one festival, 50 day festival, which means Shemini Atzeret is its own festival. Now I know people disagree with this. You can disagree, but the point is it fits the pattern. So if it fits the pattern, there's something about this Zadi, which is like Shemini Atzeret. There's something about this Zadi, which is like the Sabbath day. There's something about this Zadi, which has to do with the Ark of the Covenant, which is the, and, and, and Yom Kippur, which is the one day the sins of the people were atoned for. What I'm trying to do is show you all these other things that are in the word, in the Devarim, which have to do with Zadi. So when you see a grasshopper, you think, oh, that's like a Zadi. You might say, oh, hey, that reminds me of Shemini Yatzeret. That reminds me of the Sabbath day. That reminds me of Yom Kippur, the day that the one day that the high priest went in there to atone for the sins of the people. The Zadi, hey, that's the nine-inch spike on top. That reminds me of Yeshua being crucified on Pesach to atone for our sins so we can even come into the kingdom and regard these matters and then you have to say well but how do all these fit together well the way they all fit together is another matter but that's what the alphabet is all about I'm not going to belabor that at the moment I'm trying to ingrain with you Zadi matters but you could say going back to Mem and Nun and what has that got to do with Zadi this horizontal caliper the grasshopper the log the Zadi is the sprout. The Zadi is the letter with the sprout coming out of it. So that's like this is the Mem, and that's the Nooning out of the Mem. So even within the Zadi, there's this Mem Noon sort of picture. Well, there's another interesting thing about the Zadi in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, and what else? Aaron's rod that budded. Okay. There was also another thing, they put some, a jar of manna in there, right? Okay, but Aaron's rod that budded, it was a dead stick. It was his walking stick. Each of the 12 chiefs of the tribes had their walking stick. If you remember, some people were squabbling about, they're saying, hey, no, uh, Moses is playing favorites. He's hiring his brother to be the high priest. And Moses would say, come on, I'm not doing that kind of stuff. And they say, sure you are, look it. You know, you're giving all the good jobs to your family. And he says, okay, tell you what, everybody bring their walking sticks. 
We'll put them in a pile and we'll let Yahweh choose. Overnight, this dead stick not only sprouted, but it leafed, it put out blossoms, and it put out fruit. Well, nothing does that. that that's like three seasons worth of work and, and overnight. Obviously, it was Yahweh saying, I'm designating Aaron. This picture of something with a sprout coming out is that image of Aaron's rod that budded. So there's another picture image you get from looking at the Zadi. For what it's worth, I'll show you the modern Zadi, just so you'll be able to recognize it also. And there's some interesting imagery in the modern Zadi. If you draw it like this, To me, it almost looks like a person, you can put a head here, and it almost looks like a person kneeling, maybe their feet here, with, with their hands up, right? So it has to do with this reverence. Well, what does Zadi mean? Zadi, the word Zadi means righteous. Zadik is the righteous one. Zadika is doing righteous. What is a righteous one? Well, a righteous one is one who kneels in reverence to what? the words that are put in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. He regards Yahweh's instructions. Okay, well that's the normal Zadi, but there's five Sophit letters. And again, going back to the chart, the five Sophit letters are right in here. Kaf, Mem, Nun, Pe, and Zadi. And I believe if you render what all those letters mean, there's a message in there too. I think we addressed that once before. We can go back over it another day just if you read just the five Sophit letters. But the modern, or the, in the modern Chaldean flame letters, the final Zadi is drawn like that. What it looks like is the difference is, here's this person standing here instead of kneeling. And you could say, well, what kind of imagery might be there? And you could say, well, the hope set before us, we who regard these matters that were written on the tables of stone, is that in the by and by, we will be standing in the presence of Yahweh himself, standing there beholding him in his throne room. So this picture of Zadi is to say, those who kneel before him now will stand before him later. It's like, wow, what a, what a great hope. So there's notion called the blessed hope or the hope set before you. And Maybe it's kind of a Christian notion, but it's like, no, everybody has a hope set before them. You know, without a vision, the people perish. Without a hope, you can't keep going. Well, what's the hope that we all might have, whether you're believers or not? Almost every people group, I believe, has had some sense of eternal life or what comes after this. And some say, well, there is none. And it's like, well, maybe. Maybe there is none. But you, in order to say there is none, you had to at least consider the possibility, which means the possibility was at least on your mind. You just chose your favorite option, which is to say it's too much to deal with. And I don't want to take the responsibility, so I'm going to declare there is none, and hopefully I'm right, so I don't have to face the, as they say, face the music when the time comes. Nevertheless, it's, it's the burden on everyone's hearts. The burden on everyone's hearts is, though we die, is that the end? So the picture of the Zadi also is a picture of one who is dead suddenly coming back to life. And so here's this picture down here under the Zadi of kind of like a coffin and a skeleton sitting up with big white eyes and lines coming out of his like, uh oh, I thought I was dead. I thought that was all there was to it. So neither he was one who didn't believe in eternal life and says, uh oh, I'm in big trouble. Or he's one who wakes up and says, all right, now I get to face my reward. To endure the week or the month and suddenly get your reward, payday, it's like, hey, it all comes around. Well, you'll notice on this chart, right at the very top, the word payday is under the Zadi. In the Aleph horizontal row, which is strategy, and in the Zadi column, it says payday. And if I hadn't explained it, you might have said, what has payday got to do with the Zadi? You work your six days, and all of a sudden, hooray, here it is! Why am I dressed festively? It's like, yeah, payday! Hey, it's resurrection day! Hey, we finally get what we've been hoping for all these years. 
If you read Deuteronomy 4 and 5, that was the parasha reading for this last week. Did, it, did anybody read it? Yeah, a few people read it? Do you remember what the theme was about Deuteronomy 4 and 5? Do, do you see a Zadi concept in there? We can look back over it later at the... Maybe I'll pull it out for the next half of the meeting. The point is, a Zadi concept is the sprouting or the realization or the final, finally, wow, there's the thing that we've been hoping for, that we've been talking about, that we were told about, that we've been expecting, and here it is in reality. Remember the noon was talking about reality, and mem has to do with nurturing something, harboring something, waiting for something. So the zadi is a picture, actually, of what Mem Noon is all about. So here in this life, we've been given these words and we're told to have an expectation of what they'll bring forth. And the Zadi is, there it is, in reality, manifest right in front of us. So we're told we have faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, and it's like, well, what about faith and hope? Is it faith? Is it faithfulness? Faithful, faithfulness is fidelity, is steadfastness. Hope is that thing which says, I sure hope we're right. So now I know that some of the things I've been saying in this class, some people might say, how do you prove it? It's like, well, I've been trying to qualify a lot of these matters by simply going back to the scriptures and saying, let's look at them a different way. If you have a, a certain paradigm or a certain way of reading things, you read the scriptures, and it seems to validate what your expectations were. It supports the paradigm. But if you change your paradigm, if you change the way that you interpret things, the way you see things, what you think you're going to see, you might see things completely different. And so the point of giving this class and talking about these letters in a different way than maybe we've ever heard of them is to say, if we go back and read the same scriptures, with a different expectation, what will we find? So what, one thing I've tried to do through the class is to say, if we're talking about the letter Vav, and the Vav is a connector, a connector, a yoke is a connector. Vav is also a bridge. Vav is a nail, it's a hook. Here's the Vav on the tip of the Zadi that attached Yeshua to the stake. If you look through the scriptures and say, can I find Vav concepts embedded in the narrative? If you look for them, you can find them, if you're looking for Vav. Now, Lamed is an authority, a scepter. Remember I talked about an iron scepter? Yeah, but Lamed's an authority. Remember the, the Lamed week, I brought out this piece of wood of purple heart carved with the table, the, the words of the Ten Commandments. So here's a scepter of one sort, that was a scepter of a different sort, that was a lamed that talked about government, teach and learn, push and pull, but here's a different sort of scepter, it also has to do with push and pull, but this is a little bit more negative, you might say, than a shepherd's staff. But you might say, well, now there's a correlation between the lamed and the zadi. If the lamed says, teach and learn, and here's a push, and here's a pull, this Zadi says, this is what you're going to get if you didn't regard the proddings and the urgings, the pushing and pulling of learning the stuff back at the letter Lamed, you're going to get the uh, pokey end and the hook end. And you might say, this is actually a fire handling tool. I mean, I... I made this long enough that if there was a, a bonfire going, like maybe it's a coat or something, you could actually grab this and use this. This is, this is just ornament. This is a real useful tool. And the idea is, we talked about David's last words. And one of the last things he says, he said, when there's a righteous king, all the people rejoice. But when there's a wicked government, everybody groans. And the wicked will perish and they're like thorns that you can't pick up 
and transport the throw in the fire, you've got to hack them down and burn them where they are. If anybody's tried to clear blackberries out here in Oregon, you probably know what that's about. You need iron tools to do it. This is a picture of that. There's, there's these two different scepters. And so my point in showing you these things is that if you think about the imagery that we've been given in these words, and you associate the imagery to the letters, the letters will give you a whole different way to read the narrative that you otherwise would have just read through and just rendered them according to your English way of thinking. So the thing about these letters is that, I think we've mentioned this before also, but each letter is like a portal or a doorway or a window into a whole realm of Yahweh's invention. So we talked about this, there was a conference at Torah to the tribes. And we, we, we mentioned these types of things. I'll, I'll address it here because some people that are watching were not on the uh, benefit of the Torah to the tribes thing. But imagine if you had different types of lenses. You have an x-ray lens. You have an infrared lens, glasses that you can look through. You have certain sunglasses that block the blue light or the yellow light. You have perhaps lenses that will be telescopic, or microscopic. The point is, sorry about that, Coat's hitting the uh, microphone thing. The, the point is, each letter shows you a different aspect. You might have a, a certain type of glasses like scuba gear that can see underwater. If each letter shows you a whole different realm within the kingdom, a whole different sort of dimension, Okay, can anybody see right now in here tonight the spiritual dimension that's in this room? That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Does anybody see any demons and angels floating around? You can? What do you see? No, at this moment I don't see any angels. Oh, okay. The point is, this isn't working here. The point is, Whatever exists in the spiritual realm is here, though we can't see it. If you had certain glasses on to see them, you could see them. But we don't, so we can't because we're limited to these five senses. What I'm saying is each one of these letters that we, that we think about in Hebrew is a view like into a different dimension. So what's this dimension of Zadi? The dimension of righteousness. If you read the scriptures all through, Yahweh says, righteousness will exalt a nation. He says, those who do righteousness will prevail. The ultimate victory goes to the righteous. If you want to please Yahweh, you do righteousness. I could go on and on. You can, I'm, I'm trying to say these things to spur your own thinking as you come across these verses in the scriptures. He has a lot to say about righteousness. And in Yahweh's world, righteousness always wins. Now you might say, well, yeah, but the battle's pretty tough. And in the meanwhile, we get beat up pretty bad. And then, you know, and finally we win. You know, maybe at the end. Well, this isn't quite at the end. Notice this isn't quite at the end. You know, the sprout. So one of the things I've been trying to say is, I think I see in these scriptures that Israel sprouts back to life, resurrects, not at the end, but before the end. It's the same as the imagery of this, this Zadi. We don't wait to the very end of the world, game over, everybody rise from the dead and get your reward. And finally then he says, see now I'll pay Israel off for all the harm it's been done to, and uh, you'll see that, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, now it's payday and I'll make it good. I seem to read in the scriptures that Yahweh is going to restore the kingdom to Israel when Israel restores the regard of his words in righteousness. And that it's not ours to say, let's make a bunch of weapons for ourselves and go out and kill everybody that doesn't agree with us. Let's go out and kill everybody of a different religion, of a different look, of a different nationality. In fact, they don't keep Shabbat the same way we do. Let's kill them too. I don't think that that's what this is about. Justice and mercy. Remember the ayin? What's justice? Samic ayin pay? Do justly like the menorah, which is hold yourself to the scrutiny 
of perfectly doing what you believe is the right thing to do with the regard of the scriptural instructions. That's justice. Make sure you do what is, you're convinced in the deepest heart you have that you are absolutely doing the right thing with Elohim as your witness. That's justice. What's mercy? When your neighbor or your enemy messes up, blows it, does something against you, be generous, be merciful, be kind, compassionate, understanding, lenient, and forgiving. That's the item. What's the pay? It might be kind of disturbing to forgive your enemy. It might be kind of disturbing to give somebody a break who doesn't deserve it. Go back and listen to the words of Yeshua. Go back and listen to the words we are given in Devarim, throughout the Torah. Listen to what the prophets had to say about these matters. What's the Zadi? There is a hope set in front of us that the words that he spoke at pay will not be for nothing. They will sprout in their season, but it's righteousness that will sprout. If we think, by golly, Elohim's not doing his job fast enough, I'm going to go and turn around and do some evil to my neighbor. I'm going to do some evil to my enemy. I'm going to do some evil to that guy that just cut me off in front of the road. I'm going to do some evil to that person who just gave me a dirty look. I'm going to do some evil to that person who thinks that I wasn't, that I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? The thing that will sprout is righteousness. If we want to see Israel come back to life, look at Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. He said, speak, son of man. He always said to Ezekiel, speak, son of man, and say to these bones, live. See, he had to open his mouth and he had to speak. That's pay zadi. And what happened? The bones zadied. Well, they nooned, but they also zadied. They came back to life, and he breathed into them. Yahweh, with his pay, with his mouth, breathed breath, because pay doesn't just mean mouth, but also it comes out of the mouth, which we're talking about words and breath, wind. It's also pay concepts. He breathed into Adam, and Adam, the lump of clay, sparked to life. That's a Zadi picture. Ezekiel spoke to the valley of dry bones, and the bones came back to life. That's a Zadi picture. The Ark of the Covenant, we're talking about in Numbers 10, the Ark of the Covenant was sitting there, and it says, when the pillar of fire and pillar of smoke lifted up and moved, then everybody scrambled and picked up the Ark and moved. There's a Zadi there. The Ark is sitting dormant, and all of a sudden, it picks up and moves, and the whole camp of Israel with it. There's a Zadi picture there. It's also a noon picture. But suddenly there's a flurry of activity, whereas before everything was sedentary. For Yeshua to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the model of Jonah being three days and three nights into the belly of the fish, and suddenly coming back to life is a Zadi picture. Now, as far as I can tell, none of the authorities can prove about the Shroud of Turin. I'm not even going to go there about proving it this way or that way, but there's an interesting thing about that shroud. I remember seeing on OPB one time that they say that the image on the shroud, if the body had been laying on this shroud, it would have been kind of, you know, the backside kind of melted down into it. But the image on the shroud is as if the body was floating and suddenly exploded with like atomic energy a blast of light, but the light went in all directions. The body wasn't laying heavy on this shroud because the image doesn't look that way. Now let's assume for a minute that the shroud is valid, that it really was the piece of linen that covered Yeshua, just, just, just to tolerate that thought. Somehow when he, after fulfilling his words, three days and three nights sedentary, then just like he said, somehow he started to float up 
and exploding with, with you might say, maybe light, or ex- because it, it seems to be some kind of a photographic image, exploding with energy of some kind of atomic, and I say that and not know what I'm talking about, something, you know, those, those chemists and physics, they know what it is. The point is, it's beyond our comprehension, but it exploded and his life came back. That's a Zadi picture. And why does he get the scepter? You read in the book of Revelation, because he was the one who was slain and yet comes back to life. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. But boy, when he comes back, he's going to give them that pokey end of this thing, I'll tell you. Well, why is he going to give them the pokey end of this thing? Because Not because they poked him, but because they've rejected him, rejected his authority, did not seek forgiveness, had no repentance. You see, he's not going to retaliate. Hey, you hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you. He said, listen, the unrepentant, the unforgiving, the ones who do not want my rulership, fine, you can have what you want. You're out of here. You're gone forever. You don't want me to reign over you in righteousness? Sorry, there's no other options. You're you're gone. So I've heard it said, there was a famous painting of, uh, you might say, the return of Yeshua, and all these people were running into hell to escape him, to run away from him. It's not like he was sending them there. They didn't want him. They didn't want his righteousness. They didn't want his form of governing. They were sending themselves to hell because it was the only way to escape him. My point is, we who claim to be of Yahweh, either we will find his righteousness to be the acceptable lifestyle that is the passion of our heart, or we don't want him. That is his style. So the point about the Ten Commandments isn't a matter of say, well, you do this and then you can really, let's let's watch your enemies get in big trouble. Even Yahweh said, I don't want the wicked to perish. He wants the wicked to repent, to teshuva, to turn back to him, to learn his ways and become his people. So as we said before, anybody listening out here on this camera, you could be Islam, you could be Hindu, you could be Buddhist, you could be pagan, you could be Christian, you could be Jewish. You're all welcome to come on back to the Torah, find forgiveness because of the blood of Yeshua, decontaminate you from being in contact with the dead things, learn the ways of life, and you will sprout back to life and live forever, which is the promise that Yahweh gave us in the Old Testament. It's not Christology. It's not a Christian notion. The point about this Zadik is that it is in righteousness that we prevail. So the idea is to encourage one another to good works, which is Zadika. Not because the good works are going to get you saved, but the good works are the works of those who are the Kodeshim. Again, the word Kodesh is set apart. Kodeshim is the plural of the set apart ones. And this place of the Ark of the Covenant was in the Kodesh Kodeshim, Kadosh Kodeshim, which is the most set apart of the set apart. So maybe not everybody wants to be his righteous ones. I'm not going to tell anybody who's going to hell. Remember Yeshua gave some parables of the great man who put on a feast. He had some invited friends. When the friends didn't want to come, he sent his servants out to bring in strangers, to compel the beggars sitting by the side of the road to come in. There's another story about ten bridesmaids. Where's the bride in all this? You see, there seems to be different classifications of people that are compelled and invited to get in to the great hall. In fact, at one time, there was another parable of the guy guy put on the feast, and he comes up and he sees one person who's not dressed in the proper clothes, and he says, how did you get in here? The guy's like, oh, well, uh, you know, maybe I sneaked in. The door, he called his servants, he said, bind this man hand and foot and throw him out into the street where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. What are the robes are supposed to be dressed in? Robes of righteousness, zadika. You see, this is not just a symbol, but like the, you know, the white robes here, the white pants. I'm trying to show you black and white letters. 
the black letters, what's in between, the white spaces, the robes of righteousness, understanding how you go from letter to letter, understanding that we have to read these things, ponder these things, consider these things, and not just, oh, I'm just going to memorize the letters, but I'm going to memorize how I get from realm one to realm two, to dimension three, to dimension four, to really uh, pull these things out and see and say, well, if we can't see the invisible spiritual realm, what is, why does he even talk about it? Because there's something to see. It has to do with weighing and measuring and one person you could say well I don't see the invisible realm well the point is if what he says is ponder my words and if you see somebody who's saying we don't need to do that the voice is that get behind me Satan get behind me adversary get behind me you who have nothing to do with Yahweh's kingdom because Yahweh said you better ponder these things so one has to discern the voices by discerning the fruit by discerning the heart is that how you see the invisible? The point is, there's a lot of these things behind the meanings of the letters. So we're upon the break here, but I just want to say this. When you see this letter, there's different ways that it's shaped up here, but they all have to do, sometimes you might see an ancient scroll written like this. There's a straight line and... Unfortunately, the old way to make a noon from Jeff Benner's model is with a circle and something coming off. It almost looks like the same letter. There's a relationship between the Zadi and the Nun. So it's one thing to memorize the letters. It's another thing to memorize or to get a feel, a taste for what the letter represents. But it's another thing to say, how do I appropriate the meaning of the letter? What was Yahweh trying to tell me? And in this world, remember if the Zadi is a portal, is a window, in this realm of righteousness, not everybody can see it. Nobody but the high priest was supposed to go in that room except for once a year. And nobody could even look at the Ark of the Covenant, much less touch it. That guy that with, with David, he was zapped and died because he touched it. This is particular stuff that not everybody can handle. So what I'm talking about is to say, if you want to ponder what the true essence of righteousness is, you have to look at the letters, what's between the letters, you have to devote your heart, and you have to have a passion for righteousness. Remember what he said back at the Zadi position. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Filled. Hunger and thirst. A craving of zealousness is what Yahweh is looking for for the people who want to ponder or consider themselves to be of this caliber. But I'm not suggesting everybody's required. I'm just suggesting that if this is the hearts of all you who are listening on the tape, who are sitting in the room, these are those matters. I'm trying to bring it to your attention with zadiness. Anyway, here's the break.